Will I ever be able to write something great? I hope so. Oh, so very much. Because writing allows me to record everything. All my thoughts, ideals and fantasies. Anne Frank wrote this in her diary during the Second World War. After the war, her diary was turned into a book. It has become so famous that these words have been painted on the wall of the school she went to. A year after making this entry, Anne Frank was killed because she was Jewish. Anne was 15 years old. She wasn't the only Jewish pupil in her class. We might also tell stories of her 15 Jewish classmates, their arrests or hiding, hunger, sickness or death. But we know Anne Frank's story so well because she wrote it down herself. I hope I will be able to confide everything to you, as I have never been able to confide in anyone. And I hope you will be a great source of comfort and support. Anna Frank, 12th of June, 1942. Anne Frank began her diary on her 13th birthday. Most of it she wrote during her two years in hiding. The place where she hid is still there. It's now a museum called the Anne Frank House. People from all around the world come to see it, as well as Anne's diary, which is exhibited there. June the 12th, 1929, Anne Frank is born. Her sister Margot is three years older. Her mother, Edith, takes care of the home and family. Her father, Otto, works in a bank. They live in Frankfurt in Germany. Anne and her family are German Jews. Sometimes they go to the local synagogue. Anne and Margot often play with the other children in their neighborhood. Life is good. In 1933, an anti-Semitic political party comes to power, people who hate Jews. Their leader is Adolf Hitler. The party is called the National Socialists. Its members are called Nazis. Germany is a poor country, and Hitler has promised to help the people to rise to their former glory. He wants Germans to be proud of their country. As he sees it, they need to unite under a strong leader because they're being threatened by enemies. According to the Nazis, the Jews are Germany's greatest enemy. They portray Jews as dangerous. Since time immemorial, the Jews have been blamed for other people's problems. This makes it easier for many Germans to believe what Hitler tells them. When the Nazis take power, they go straight to work. They start arresting anyone with ideas different to their own and put them in prison camps. They burn books by Jews and political opponents. They introduce many anti-Jewish laws. They have Jewish teachers and civil servants fired from their jobs. Jewish students must sit apart in classrooms. Nazis also discriminate against gypsies, homosexuals, and the disabled. They prevent people from shopping in Jewish-owned stores. The Nazis are everywhere. It's getting dangerous for Jews. Anne's parents no longer want to live in Germany. Her father gets the chance to start up a company in the Netherlands, and they decide to leave. In this way, the Frank family comes to Amsterdam. Anne is almost five years old. Their house is in a new neighborhood in Amsterdam, and Anne soon feels at home there. She goes to school and learns Dutch. She has Dutch and German friends to play with because she's not the only German-Jewish refugee in her neighborhood. Sometimes Anne accompanies her father to work. Otto Frank's company is called Opecta. There, they make an ingredient for making jam. Otto makes a film to advertise his product. In it, 
Meep Heath, one of Otto's employees, shows how to use Opecta. Otto has to work hard. He isn't home much. Anne's mother is homesick for Germany. She writes often to her friends and family. She'd like to go back, but she knows that's not possible. Life is getting worse and worse for the Jews there. Now, Jews may not own businesses. They may not marry non-Jews. In fact, the Nazis want just one thing, to get rid of all Jews. In November of 1938, Germans lash out at the Jews, destroying synagogues, Jewish homes, and shops. We now call it Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. Jews are beaten and arrested. Those that can leave, but many countries refuse them entry. Anne's grandmother comes to Amsterdam. She's 73. They all hope to be safe here. Hitler and the Nazis now want power over all of Europe. They build more and more weapons. In 1939, the German army invades Poland. England and France join the fight because they are allies with Poland. The Second World War has begun. On the 10th of May, 1940, the German army invades the Netherlands. It is so powerful that it occupies the Netherlands in just five days. Still, the Dutch army manages to fight back until the Germans bomb Rotterdam. After the bombardment, there is nothing left of Rotterdam's city center. When the German army threatens to bomb other cities in the same way, the Dutch choose to surrender. The Nazis are now in power in the Netherlands. What they did in Germany, they can now do here too. In the meantime, the German army has invaded and conquered Belgium and France. They have closed all the borders. Escape is almost impossible. At first, the German occupation doesn't seem all that bad. Anne and Margot can go anywhere they like. Not much has changed. Anne lives on Merveda Square in South Amsterdam. One time she's caught on film. It's the only film of her in existence. A young woman in her apartment building is getting married. The wedding couple and family come outside. People are watching from their windows and on the street. Anne is leaning out of her window. It almost looks like she's saying, hey, I'm being filmed. A few months later, Anne and Margot are forced to go to a new school, the Jewish grammar school. Jewish children may no longer attend school together with non-Jewish children. Slowly but surely, the Nazis go about limiting the Jews' freedom. First, they may not work for the government. Then, they must hand over their companies to the Nazis. Then, they must carry identification papers stamped with a big J. Now, they can't even go out and be in the same place with other people. Now they must wear a yellow star, so everyone can see they're Jewish. On her 13th birthday, Anne receives a diary. She's very happy with it and starts writing in it immediately. Sunday, 14th of June, 1942. I still have a lot to tell you. I'll begin from the moment I got you, the moment I saw you lying on the table. Anne treats her new diary like a friend. She has no idea that in three weeks she will never be able to see her real friends ever again, but she will have to go into hiding. It all happens on a Sunday. Anne is sitting in the sun reading. Someone rings the doorbell. It's the postman with a registered letter for Margot. She is being ordered to report for work duty in Germany. But this isn't just any work order. Everyone knows if Margot goes to Germany, she'll probably never be heard of again. But if she doesn't report, 
The police will come after her and punish her whole family, too. I was stunned. A call-up. Everyone knows what that means. Visions of concentration camps and lonely cells raced through my head. Anne's parents saw it coming. They had already planned to hide from the Nazis, and they decided that the time had come. The next morning, Meep Hees comes to pick Margot up. They get on their bicycles and ride away together. Then Anne leaves with her parents. They take as many clothes and other things as they can without looking conspicuous. The walk takes an hour. Anne's father explains that the hiding place is behind his company building. It's in the center of town near the Western Church. The front part houses the company offices and storage areas, but behind that there's another house, a secret annex, where they can hide. The office workers already know of their plans. Meep Hees, Bep Voskal, Victor Kuchler, and Jo Kleiman have been helping Anne's father to furnish the hiding place. They have promised to provide them with food and any supplies they might need. That's dangerous. People who are caught helping the Jews are severely punished. Ten days later, another family joins them. Hermann von Pels has been Otto's co-director in the business. He and his wife Gusti have been regular guests at the Frank home for years. Their son Peter doesn't particularly impress Anne. She finds him shy and a little dull. The hiding place in the secret annex has two stories and an attic. The Frank family lives on the lower floor in two rooms. One is for Otto and Edith, the other is for Margot and Anne. Above them is a large room where Hermann and Gusti van Pelt sleep. This also serves as the dining room and kitchen for the whole group. Peter has his own room next to them. The stairs lead to the attic, which is used for storage. Of course, we are not allowed to look out of the window at all, or to go outside. Also, we have to do everything softly in case they hear us below. And then I'm really afraid that we'll be discovered and shot. Their hiding place must always remain a secret. Their neighbors at the back must never see them, so they hang curtains at the windows and always keep them closed. The building's ground floor is a warehouse and runs from the back garden all the way to the street. The people working there must never suspect what's happening right above their heads. This is a problem as the walls and floors are very thin, so the families in hiding have to be completely quiet during the day. The door to the secret annex is hidden behind a bookcase, hanging on hinges. The people in hiding are relieved that Margot didn't report for transport to Germany, especially when they hear about what happens to Jews who don't hide or escape. Our many Jewish friends are being taken away in droves. The Gestapo is treating them very roughly and transporting them in cattle trucks to Westerbork, the big camp for Jews in Drenthe. Escape is almost impossible. If it's that bad in Holland, what must it be like in those far away and uncivilized places where the Germans are sending them? We assume that most of them are being murdered. The English radio says they're being gassed. Perhaps that's the quickest way to die. I feel terrible. In November, another person joins the group in hiding. His name is Fritz Pfeffer, a long-time acquaintance of the family. He's given a bed in Anne's room. Margot will now have to sleep in her parents' room. Anne is not happy about Fritz Pfeffer. He is strict, and he often scolds her if she does something wrong. And then he goes and tells Anne's mother. They argue often. In fact, the others have arguments as well. After all, it's very hard for eight people to live together at such close quarters, and always with the fear of being caught hanging over them. Pfeffer describes to them how the Nazis and their helpers close off entire streets and then force all the Jews out of their own homes, including children, the elderly, and the sick.
For weeks now, he says, the Nazis have been rounding up thousands of Jews and sending them to Westerbork transit camp. From there, they are taken in cattle trains to Eastern Europe. Their homes and shops are ransacked, and entire streets fall still. Anne has a friend, Sana, in Westerbork. Six months later, another friend, Hannah Lee, will be taken away. Anne feels guilty. I feel wicked sleeping in a warm bed, while somewhere out there my dearest friends are dropping from exhaustion or being knocked to the ground, all because they're Jews. Anne shivers with fear when she hears that Rauter, the German chief of police, has announced that all Jews must be removed from the Netherlands by July 1st, 1943. In secret, the Nazis have decided to kill as many Jews as they can. But Anne also feels encouraged when she hears that people are resisting the occupation force. Resistance fighters in Amsterdam have set fire to the city's board of records. This will make it much harder for police to track down the Jews. The radio updates the people in hiding about developments abroad. Armies from a number of different countries are trying to push the Nazis back. In July 1943, Allied armies defeat the German army in North Africa. British, Canadian and US troops land in Sicily. The German army is now surrounded. The Russians are attacking from the east, and from the west, British and American air forces fly bombing raids every night over Germany. From her room, Anne can hear them passing overhead. The number of airstrikes on German cities is increasing daily. We haven't had a good night's rest in ages, and I have bags under my eyes from lack of sleep. Factories, even entire cities are being leveled. Amsterdam is bombed as well. This time, the British Air Force tried to bomb an aircraft factory, but the bombs fell on a residential neighborhood and all just a few miles from the secret annex. The destruction seems to be terrible. Whole streets lie in ruins. It still makes me shiver to think of the dull, distant drone that signified the approaching destruction. The Western Church, just a block away from the secret annex, is an important building in Amsterdam. In the summer of 1943, the fire department makes a film to show how they can protect it if necessary. You can just make out the secret annex in the picture. Maybe Anne was writing in her diary at that very moment. Wednesday, 23rd of February, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this morning, when I went to the attic again, Peter was busy clearing up. He finished quickly and came over to where I was sitting on my favorite spot on the floor. He stood and I sat. We breathed in the air, looked outside, and both felt that the spell shouldn't be broken with words. I knew then that he was a good, decent boy. The two of them spend a lot of time together. But after a few months, Anne doesn't feel as in love as she used to, and she distances herself from Peter. Instead, she spends more time with her diary. Wednesday, 29th of March, 1944. Dear Kitty, Last night, Mr. Bolkestein, the Cabinet Minister, speaking on the Dutch broadcast from London, said that after the war, a collection will be made of diaries and letters dealing with the war. Of course, everyone pounced on my diary. Just imagine how interesting it would be if I were to publish a novel about the secret annex. The title alone would make people think it was a detective story. Anne starts rewriting everything on separate sheets of paper, all for her new book. Tuesday, 6th of June, 1944. Dearest Kitty, this is the day the English news announced at 12 o'clock. And quite rightly, this is the day the invasion has begun. 
Tourniquet No. 1. Under the command of General Eisenhower, Allied naval forces, supported by strong air forces, began landing Allied armies this morning on the northern coast of France. The German army is not expecting this invasion. The Allies are strong, but their advance is painfully slow. The German army fights back hard. Only when the Allies have established a beachhead will they be able to gain ground. Anne's father Otto keeps a map of Normandy on the wall. On it, he charts the Allied advance. Every day, every hour, they listen for the latest news on the radio. Would the long-awaited liberation ever come true? Oh, Kitty. The best part of the invasion is that I have the feeling that friends are approaching. Anne and Margot hope they'll be able to go back to school in October. They're already making plans for the future. Margot wants to become a maternity nurse. Anne wants to be a writer and journalist. While rewriting old pages in her diary, Anne continues to add new ones. She starts thinking more and more about herself and the world around her. It's twice as hard for us young people to hold on to our opinions at a time when ideals are being shattered and destroyed, when the worst side of human nature predominates, when everyone has come to doubt truth, justice and God. It's a wonder I haven't abandoned all my ideals. They seem so absurd and impractical. Yet I cling to them because I still believe, in spite of everything, that people are truly good at heart. It's utterly impossible for me to build my life on a foundation of chaos, suffering and death. Anne would never get to see the peace. The Allied forces are approaching Paris when on August the 4th, 1944, someone phones the German police in Amsterdam with the message, there are Jews hiding at number 263 Prinzengracht. Immediately, an SS officer drives to the building accompanied by Dutch policemen. They march in through the warehouse and climb the stairs to the offices. The staff are taken by surprise and cannot do anything. Jo Kleiman and Victor Kuchler are arrested. The police walk on through to the annex and arrest all those in hiding. They are taken to prison. Beb Foskow and Miep Gies are left behind. Later that day, they have a look in the annex. The police have ransacked the place looking for anything of value. In among the mess, Meep finds Anne's diary and other papers and decides to keep them for when Anne returns. After her arrest, Anne Frank is moved from one concentration camp to another. She starts off with the others at the Westerbork transit camp. A month later, Following a three-day-long trip without food or water, they end up at Auschwitz, the enormous extermination camp in Poland. After almost two months, Anne and Margot are sent to Bergen-Belsen. She survives there for another five months until she finally succumbs to hunger, cold, exhaustion and sickness in March 1945. Just a few weeks later, the English liberate Bergen-Belsen. By that time, though, there are more dead people there than living. Margot always stays with Anne until she dies of typhus just before her little sister. Anne's mother dies of hunger and exhaustion in Auschwitz. Gusti van Pels dies during transport to Theresienstadt. Hermann van Pels dies in the gas chamber in Auschwitz. Peter van Pels dies in Mauthausen on May the 5th, 1945. 
Fritz Pfeffer dies in the Neuengamme work camp. Only Otto Frank would survive the ordeal. Of the 107,000 Dutch Jews deported to the concentration camps, only 5,000 survived. In May of 1945, the German army surrenders. The war is over, the Nazis have been defeated. In June of 1945, Otto Frank returns to the Netherlands. Victor Kuchler and Jo Kleiman have survived their arrest. After Otto hears what has happened to his wife and children, Miep gives him Anne's diary. He reads everything she has written, including her wish to turn her diary into a book. He collates all her notes and he publishes her diary. By doing this, he fulfills his daughter's wish to become a writer. When I returned, and after I had the news that my children would not come back, me gave me the diary, which had been saved by, I should say, a miracle. It took me a very long time to read it. And I must say, I was very much surprised about the deep thoughts on the head. Her seriousness, especially her self-criticism. It was quite a different Anna I had known as my daughter. She never really showed this kind of inner feeling. She talked about many things, we criticized many things, but what really their feelings were, I only could see from the diary.